Popeye the Sailor Man. I Popeye the Sailor Man. I am what I am, and that's all what I am. I Popeye the Sailor Man. Popeye's very, very similar to these medieval uh, sculptures. You have a sense of transcendence taking place here. Here with Popeye, it's transcendence of male energy. He heats that spinach, and he transcends into this strength. And I think, you know, that's the art. The spinach is art. And art can change your life. It can expand your parameters. It can give this vastness uh, uh, to life. He's the sort of first ordinary superhero, isn't he? You know, I am what I am. And, you know, that's one of the things that uh, my art tries to communicate to people, that you're perfect. In life, we have to first learn to accept ourselves, and then we can have this transcendence into the acceptance of others. There's something of the evangelist in him. Dare I say, there's something of the Billy Graham in him. But there's nobody like him in the world now. And he's invented a language. That's the most fantastic achievement that any artist can uh, aspire to. He's very bright, he's very clued up, and in a way the brightness and the clued upness are the things I really most dislike about his work. These medieval pieces were really embedded with kind of spiritual powers. I mean, I, I look at something like this and I think more of it being embedded with the power of Led Zeppelin, you know, and uh, I, I mean, I learned how to feel in this world through situations like that, uh, you know, a band like Zeppelin. How to feel. I would buy that in a heartbeat if I could afford it. I feel alive and it's just fantastic. You can see by my smile how much I love it. I think he's a great, good marketing guy. I think a lot of feminists have a hard time with his work. Sex and death really describes coons, frankly. <laughs> um, if it gets everybody cranky, that's a good thing. There were five girls on stage on the camera. All taking their clothes off. You could be getting a lot of energy from that. People don't tell you it's a good thing to get energy. It just reminds me of a kid's holiday on a beach, yeah. But the fact it's inflated, but it's probably made of metal, I think that's the real mystery behind it. I want to touch it, but I'm not allowed to, yeah. It's a good painting. If he painted that, I'd be really impressed, but I don't think he did. It's a very good Good opportunity for us young artists, you know, to um, find some inspiration. I quite like this one. What does it make you feel like? What does it remind you of? Childhood. Cartoon. Yeah, cartoon, like what I watched on TV when I was young. I couldn't believe that art was that simple and to be that effective. I just wanted to make a Jeff Coons. He was always telling me, Mary, you always have to talk about things being new. People didn't talk like that. Even Andy didn't talk like that. There are so many ways in which Jeff was so advanced to what ended up happening. Jeff Koon's first major retrospective is now traveling Europe, but it started here in New York. It's the first time the Whitney has given over the whole museum to a single artist. It's rare for an artist to be so honored, yet so controversial. I'm enjoying every moment of this, I have to tell you. <laughs> and I'm enjoying it because I really believe in art. It's taught me how to become a better human being. I'm 59 years of age right now, but I really feel that it's about the future, 
I believe that I have like another at least three decades uh, to create art, and I'm so grateful for the Whitney to give me the opportunity to do it up to this moment. So thank you very much. Thank you. Picasso is such a fantastic example of late in life, you know, making the body of work. I really want to exercise the freedom I have as an artist to make the things that I want to and to get as close to enlightenment as possible. Jeff Koons does sometimes talk like a new age guru. He's often dismissed as cynical and superficial. The banker's darling. But there's something unsettling in the work that makes it far more interesting than that. Koons has eight children himself, six of them with his second wife, Justine, who was once a sculptor at his studio. And his own childhood reverberates through his work. When I would be eight years old, I'd go door to door, and I'd sell gift wrapping paper, I would sell chocolates. I never knew who was going to open that door. I didn't know what odors were going to come out of the home, whether they were cooking, and what those odors may be. If they invited me into the home, you know, I didn't know what the furnishings were going to be, uh, if they're going to have plastic on everything. But that form of acceptance and that form of meeting needs, of me trying to meet the needs of the person that answered the door and of them trying to meet my needs, this form of communication, something that I've been very involved with my whole life. You brought your two worlds together, haven't you? Yes, it's really kind of full circle for me. <laughs> This is the latest work. The, the gazing bowl is very important to me, this aspect of reflectivity. And when I was young growing up, people in Pennsylvania would put these gazing bowls in the yard. And for me, it's really about feeling. So this is about this kind of utilitarian object. The mailbox is irrelevant today. I mean, you know, it's email today. Even the bucket, the bucket which is holding up the uh, the mailbox, I mean, that at one time maybe had pain in it. It had a function. All of these things are making reference to our own mortality and how everything turns to dust. I hear that your gazing balls really intrigue the Nobel Prize winner, Eric Kandel. Eric's a neuroscientist and uh, studies the mind and the brain, and he loves art. So what we spoke about was Professor Regal at the end of the 19th century. He developed this phrase, the beholder's share. And he was the first to really speak about art being finished inside the viewer. Alois Regal was the first art historian to, said, to say, Art history is going to die unless it becomes more scientific. The science it should relate itself to is psychology, and the problem it should focus on is the beholder, how you, the viewer, respond to a work of art. Throughout the Renaissance, you bought a work of art because you were interested in what was being depicted. And that all changed when Velasquez did Les Meninas, probably one of the most important paintings in Western art. And he stands and he says, I am the reason you buy this because I am the genius who creates the art. Sheely carried this further. You see in his paintings all these unbelievable postures. In a two year period, he did 100 self portraits. The only reason the art is interesting is because it's about me, I can express everything. And Sheila, of course, used to look in the mirror all the time and see himself in the mirror. Absolutely right. Now, what does Jeff Koons do? He creates a mirror, so when you look at the work of art, you see yourself in it. 
This is the first time a systematic attempt was made to incorporate the beholder into the work of art. You actually visualize yourself. I've never seen that before, and I've looked at art for much of my life. Everything is dependent on you. When you move, you know, uh, the abstraction happens. If, if you're not here, it's not happening. Uh, everything's happening inside you. This is just some form of transponder. Concentrate! Concentrate! I will now bear the naked truth of your baby days. The only thing you really have in life in general, you have your interests. And when you focus on your interests and really dwell on that and focus on that, it takes you to a connecting place where time really kind of bends. And you can uh, be in contact really with the ancients. You can also get your foot into the future. The first works in the show from 1978 are very simple, almost childlike. This is my first uh, rabbit. I mean, I had to go drink some beer. I mean, it was like such an intense experience. You, you were painting flowers when you were a young child as well, weren't you? Well, I started taking art lessons at uh, the age of seven. And uh, yes, I would draw vases of flowers and uh, with pastel and with charcoal. Uh, my father was an interior decorator and had a furniture store, so I was brought up with things just displaying themselves. Uh, a light would just display itself, an ashtray. It would just be there. And this is where his father's furniture store was. And there's his father filming it. His father, Henry Coons, was the leading interior decorator in York. Jeff had a lot of insight into how the people who aspired to be wealthy decorated their homes, how more middle class people decorated their homes. Then he saw the aesthetic connected with more modest people. He took that all in. Jeff Koons' vast New York studio, down by the river in Chelsea, is a step on from his father's store. It employs over a hundred people who work according to his very precise instructions. My father taught me aesthetics and he taught me feelings that, uh, you know, if you put two different colors together, if you put gold and turquoise together, you're going to have a different feeling than if you put red and black together. My dad really showed me how you create a vision and a type of control and commitment that's necessary. Growing up in, uh, in York, I mean, it wasn't uh, too fast of a lifestyle. There was enough time to kind of absorb things. My uh, grandfather used to have carriages. Being in our local parade, and we would have horses uh, pull the carriages and maybe we would be dressed in colonial outfits. These memories of, of things affect your feeling. I know nothing about his childhood per se. I know what he says about it. And I'm almost exactly the same age, so we experience the same American culture through television and what it was like to be a kid in the late 50s and early 60s. But I, I think what is extraordinary about Coons is his complete celebration of that experience. He talks about cereal boxes and what it was like to be taken by the almost pop images on those boxes. Excited to come down to the kitchen, dive into a bowl of cereal. He sexualizes the experience. Um, I 
but he's, he says again and again that he wants to recreate that delight in things. He puts into play desire, I mean, even as a child, at least in his memories of his childhood. But that desire is always a consumerist one. That's the best desire. It's almost beyond sexual. I mean, products give you what you really want. He wants to embody that post-war American being kind of made by consumer culture. My grandfather used to have an ashtray, and it was uh, in his television room beside his chair, a woman lying down on her back on a couch. If you touch it, her legs would swing back and forth. And she also had a fan here uh, in her one breast. And as a child, I would go and I would just play with this piece all the time. I was so amazed. It brought so much kind of awe and wonder to me. It's kitsch, it's sexist, and it's like a ready-made. Something already existing in the world that becomes a work of art. You can see where Jeff Coombs is heading. His first dealer remembers what Coombs was like in his very early days in New York. Jeff is no different than when I met him when he was 22 years old mm. in 1978. I came into a studio that was about the size of this little space that we're taking up. I got the feeling that he lived there. He had bought plastic mirrors, like at the Five and Dime store, and he had lined the walls, floors, and ceilings with the, these plexiglass mirrors, like tiled together, and then Velcroed onto this these inflatable toys. And I'd never seen anything like it. Jeff had his own voice from very early on. During the time of making this work, uh, I'm working at the Museum of Modern Art. So every day I'm absorbing the collection. I'm looking at the architecture design department. I'm watching films on Duchamp. I'm really getting uh, involved with concepts of the ready. It's the eye of the artist who makes the art and then, if you like, gives it to others. But why is the urinal on the pedestal a work of art? Why does it suddenly become this amazingly sexually sort of pregnant object? Hmm? It's because, you know, suddenly you see the form, the kind of functional form, and suddenly it becomes something else that kind of appeals to the imagination, and that's the beauty of it. We can laugh about gnomes in the garden, or whatever, but uh, if put in the right situation, they become something else. When I started off as a young artist, at a certain point, Marcel Duchamp was everything to me, and uh, I thought everything was based on uh, Marcel. I always have loved the idea, the avant-garde, from a time of like Courbet, as like the father of the avant-garde, people like Dali and Duchamp, uh, Picasso, Picabia, you know. Uh, it was the belief that we're going somewhere together as a social movement together. And so I started to work with ready-made objects. I would uh, just walk down the street, and if something moved me, I would respond to that. And I would acquire inflatable flowers or vacuum cleaners. When I showed him, I basically sold two pieces, one for $700 and one for $1,200 in the course of two years. I think the first piece I sold was a rug shampooer with a neon light. It buzzed. The only other piece I sold, and this was like in two years, was to Charles Sanchi, the, a double-decker vacuum cleaner. Coons was now embarking on a major new project, which was to make his name, the new. But vacuum cleaners were expensive. 
Jeff needed to make as much money as possible, as fast as possible. So he used his communications abilities to sell commodities on Wall Street. So by day he was raising funds and by night he was uh, making his work. That's right. He got his vacuum cleaners. Jeff understands seduction, sales, is inherent to making a work of art. Why would somebody want to look at an object, eventually buy it and possess it? What kind of inherent seduction is there? He's read Kierkegaard's Diary of a Seducer. That's his mantra. Caution, my beautiful unknown. Caution. These are objects of desire, desirable objects. You call it the new, but you're actually being quite literal. They are very, very new, aren't they? Oh, they're brand new. I mean, these are, they're kind of eternal virgins. For us to have integrity, we have to participate in life. And for an object, it has its greatest uh, integrity when it's born. It's brand new. It can display its integrity forever. It doesn't have to participate. This is almost like an Egyptian tomb. You know, the, the rug shampoos are like sarcophagus. There. Think of a toddler crawling on the floor, his suburban house, while his mother is vacuuming. And there is this monstrous machine connected to his mother that has this explosive sound, the sucking, it's identified with things that Jeff loves, the clean, the new, but it is also an extension of his mother. The vacuum cleaner becomes this symbol for the human life. On the side of the vacuum cleaners, a wet dry. That's like Kierkegaard's either or. So your interest in language and how you what you call things, mm -hmm. it's clearly pretty important to you. I mean, if I look here, we have the new, new two. Two has the double O. You know, Coons has the double O in the center. Over here, we have Rumi. Again, you have the O's, like Coons, uh, the multiple uh, O's. Uh, you know, I wanted when people would look at a vacuum cleaner, they would think of my work. The BBC has been following Jeff Koons since he was new. Accusing him of hype is like rebuking a fish for being wet. Have you ever actually done any carving or modeling? Uh, no. No. When I was a child, I did some uh, modeling. But what with plasticine? That's correct. This is the first encounter with the art critic William Fever. Fever depicted Coons as the latest disaster in Saatchi's patronage of New York art. The show includes works by Jeff Coons. Here he is, polishing his plexiglass. He's a former commodity broker who evidently took to art for its value-added attractions. Jeff Koons, let's talk advertising. You've got a product here, now what are you selling? This piece that this I piece here, yeah. I'm standing by right now. I displayed vacuum cleaners so that the viewer would have a gestalt of being a mortal and confronting an object that's in a position of being immortal. Is there something about these particular vacuum cleaners as opposed to any other model? Uh, well, I like Hoover. I always like the idea of the door-to-door -door salesman. Just a very open, warm object. And I always like the idea of the idea of the vacuum of art, the emptiness of art. His trajectory since then has gone with the money, so to speak, and he's gone with the management, and he's gone with the product placement and the product burnishing. It's so calculated, so pre-pitched, so almost pre-sold, pre-placed, that it's, it lacks all the, the give and the, the breath of fresh art.
But the Saatchi show made a huge impression on young British artists. When I was an art student, I went to the Saatchi gallery and I saw New York Art Now. That completely blew me away. My tutors at Goldsmiths, which they didn't like it. They said it wasn't good art. Do you see a dark side to his work at all? I see a dark side to it, yeah. I mean, I see a dark side to all of that kind of stuff. I mean, I, th I think all art is about, you know, fear of death. I think, it, you know, it has to be. And I think, you know, there's no way out of that. And even if you offer, you know, immortality or hope, I see a lot of hope in Jeff's work, but I can also see a lot of death too. And it makes me think about my own death, absolutely. Coons now suspended basketballs in equilibrium, balanced in the center of tanks of water. It's a thing of wonder. It's like the embryo in the womb. This is a pre-birth and after death, a state where all pressures are equal. I wanted permanent equilibrium, but it's only temporary. Under the best conditions, this could only last for about six months, and then you have to reinstall it. He surrounded the basketball tank with adverts. The sports stars tempt you to follow them, like the sirens of classical myth, who lured sailors to the rocks. The tools for the equilibrium are like the snorkel that are here, the lifeboat, or the aqualung. I mean, this would take you under, but it would drown you, because it's made out of bronze. So. Somehow, if you could get this off your back and resurface, you'd see the lifeboat and hope that was your salvation, but it would take you right back down. Artists are kind of presenting themselves like these sirens here, that they've achieved something and playing like they're stars but it's really about going for it. The ads lure you to your death. The life-saving devices drag you down. Art is another siren, another seducer, but also possibly a lifesaver. And these are themes which have become a life's work for Jeff Coons. They're basketballs. They're basketballs. It's floating there, but is it, is it almost like by water? Because I see bubbles. An unbelievable detective. The artist who made this piece is standing right in this room today. Yeah. So we can ask him That's great. How, Hi, how he are created you? this. <laughs> yeah. right, do you remember what his name is? <laughs> this is Jeff Coombs. So now let's let's ask him. Go ahead, ask him your question. Is it really in water? I'm sorry. Could it float by nothing? Well, no, because everything has to uh, go by the laws of physics. So those balls have to be uh, too heavy to go to the top of the tank, but they have to be too light not to go to the bottom. What's taking place, the water at the bottom of the tank is heavy. It's heavy water. It weighs 1.3. And the water at the top is regular distilled water. It weighs one. So that difference, those balls are sitting on top of that heavy water. I can remember around the age of four, after making a drawing, my parents coming up behind me and saying, you know, that's really great, you know, that's fantastic. All of a sudden, I had this feeling that I could do something. I had a sense of myself, and I finally could do something better than my sister. So I found my place in the family, and I think that's why, you know, I'm here today. It's so fantastic to be receiving an education because all the information is going to be in play for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.
And outside of my kindergarten classroom, there was a little wooden shed. And it was uh, painted green. And you would ask them for art supplies. And uh, they would give you popsicle sticks or, you know, paper and some crayons. I spent a lot of time at this shed. I could draw a vase of flowers, make ellipses just correct, and you know, the shading. But you know, I have to say in my younger uh, years, until I really came into contact with what art could be and the power of art, art was something that uh, basically probably created anxiety, you know. He was waiting for praise fearful of failure. This is Jeff just before he went off to art school. I always felt like an outsider to the art world. I mean, art was this privileged vocabulary and I felt almost intimidated. I didn't know all the rules. My first day of art school, I knew Picasso, but I didn't know Matisse's work. I didn't know Brock, I didn't know Cezanne. In life, in so many areas, people don't survive moments where they're disempowered. I remember when I was nine years old, I wanted to play football. When I went to try out for the team, everybody already knew how to play. And I could have experienced that same thing at art school. I survived that moment, but most people don't. When he was 18, he tracked down his hero, the surrealist Salvador Dali. My mother had read that Dali spent half his year at the St. Regis Hotel in New York. And I thought, I'll call Dali up. I'll see if I can meet him. He told me he would be in the lobby at uh, 12 o'clock on Saturday. And exactly at 12 o'clock, he appeared. He posed for some photographs. I was just this kid from Pennsylvania, and he took the time and the, the generosity to be there. And I left that night, and I really went back home, thinking, you know, I can do this. At his first art school, he started painting from his dreams on an inward journey. Coons then signed on at the Art Institute in Chicago. He was drawn here by a group of artists called the Chicago Images and fell under the spell of one in particular, Ed Paschke. Paschke was relatively unknown, but was Jeff Coons' inspiration and his mentor. They formed a rapport, back and forth friendship. The experience is maybe what Jeff was looking for in, in meeting my dad, getting to know the person and, and what he's about and how he interacts with the world around him. My dad probably had some inkling there that there's a little something different with this guy. And he was right on the money on that one. <laughs> I remember a couple times where we uh, went to see uh, Saturday Night Fever. Come on, you gotta see this movie. Oh, we love this movie. Jeff is a regular person, really nice guy, and, and interested in everybody. So when he got into this fame, this like blew my mind. This is just Jeff, what? <laughs> figure out what's going on here. Okay, yeah. Ed Paschke revealed a whole new world to Jeff. Pop on acid, that's what I think Chicago was. P very hepped up, very hepped up color, fantastical. It's a crazy time in the 70s. Warhol and Liechtenstein, way too straight. Jim Nutt Paschke, out of control, hepped up. 
pop on acid. I used to be Ed's assistant. So I would work with him and I'd stretch his canvases and I'd work on his uh, painting, sometimes painting certain areas. But uh, after work, he would take me and he would show me where he gets his source material. Kuhn's really dug Paschke's irreverence. Coons to midget bars, to wrestling matches, to strip clubs, tattoo parlors. That was the underbelly that the imagists dug that Coons was certainly drawn to, like moths to a flame. It was a form of visual slumming, and that is something that Coons surely got invested in. He's doing a lot of visual slumming, turned high art. taught me that everything's here, that within the universe, everything's already here. You just have to look for it. Paschke was very interested in sexy magazines, pinup girls. The eroticism in Coons certainly would have been kindled while he was in Chicago. I remember laying in bed one night when I was in Chicago and hearing Patti Smith come on the radio. And they played her Horses album, and it was fantastic. And I thought, you know, uh, this is where I'd really like to be. I'd like to be in New York. Boy, look to Johnny. Johnny wanted to run. And I got up and I hitchhiked the next day to the city. So my first night here, I had dinner with David Byrne. I really stayed on since then. He found himself living next door to David Byrne of the newly formed Talking Heads. He talked on video to his new friend about his background in Pennsylvania. Yeah, middle class bar, I can't stand. Where I'm from, that's all there. That's all they have is middle class bars. And, you know, everybody says it's a nice bar. <clears throat> There's nothing there. Nothing at all. Where I spent my New Year's Eve. <laughs> in a strip bar in Baltimore What's down on the block. But there were five girls on stage at one time. All taking their clothes off? Yeah. It was real nice, real comfortable feeling. You don't feel like you have to be something or anybody. It is. It's pretty real. He was distancing himself from the world he'd grown up in but he would always return to it in his art, once his career in New York took off. The local toy shop is still there. Maybe it was this train that took root in his imagination. Oh, Coons made his train in steel in 1986, it's a replica of a marketing curio made by a whiskey distiller and fueled by alcohol. Jeff had his train filled with alcohol too. It was part of a series he called Luxury and Degradation. This is what he said about it at the time. It's a very seductive object. And even though it's made in a proletarian material like stainless steel, I feel like I'm being uplifted. I feel that it's talking to me about wealth. It's talking to me about uh, social mobility. I mean, my gosh, the train is a symbol of mobility. It, it opened up the West. It's opened up continents. And it makes me feel that I can achieve my desires for, for luxury and enlightenment. And that's seven-fifths of bourbon there. I could drink a fifth of bourbon. 
And I'm sure that I would feel the physical intoxication the same way I'm perceiving the visual intoxication. When you see them in stainless steel, they're harsh. They become something else. Over the years that follow, things become larger than life to the point sometimes where there's a, almost a level of absurdity and, and I would say fear. It was as if Kuhn saw Duchamp's ready-mades everywhere and the surrealism that he loved. But another huge influence was the seductive power of advertising. It brings to mind another American artist. If Warhol ever had a son, it would have been Jeff Koons. If you look at the time, the milieu, the period of which Jeff emerges, it's really in a very sophisticated understanding of media and advertising. And I think Warhol's the forerunner to that. But where Warhol was a working class immigrant kid whose parents were from Czechoslovakia, you know, Coons is a next generation. He's more of a middle class guy. And the most obvious thing he picks up from Warhol is this posture of liking everything. Do you like any names? You like everybody. You like everybody. Yeah, I really do. But you, you like Marilyn. You like. Yeah. What about Garber? Do you like Garber? Oh, yeah, yeah. I just like everybody. Like Warhol, Coons says that he wants to relieve us of our alienation. So it's a whole posture, not just the found image, found object that Coons picks up from, from Warhol, but a, a openness to the world. Now, how sincere that is, that's another question. One of Coons' mantras is that after art school, he moved from making subjective to objective art, taking himself out of the picture. He was invested in the subjective. He claims to have moved to the objective, but I don't believe him. Have a little dirt. Those objects harken back to inner feelings, inner emotions that he's making large. Now Coons moved way out into the realms of the fantastic. These bizarre Baroque pieces he calls banalities. They're made by craftsmen all over the world. They combine a weird and disturbing assortment of images copied from cartoons, churches and gift shops. So what was he up to? For me, this was really a little bit like a Garden of Eden. I was trying to communicate to people that uh, everything about them is perfect. I remember seeing the Masaccio painting the expulsion in Florence and uh, Adam and Eve being cast out of the garden with such guilt and shame. And so I wanted to help remove that guilt and shame. So you felt these works had a kind of social purpose? We were coming out of minimalism and conceptualism and it was like if you would tell artists, oh, I want to make work that manipulates or seduces to try to communicate, it's like, what? You know, you don't manipulate, you don't seduce. But if you don't, you're going to become disempowered and not be able to help people in life. Why did you call the collection of word banality then? Because it was a sort of provocation as well to call it banality, wasn't it? Well, uh, it's about the things that you experience. That, I mean, this was Michael Jackson and Bubbles. This was my Pieta. It's using Renaissance form, this triangular form, the Christ-like figure, to let people know it's okay to embrace oneself, to have acceptance of the self. But then again, why call it banality 
if it's meant to be so reassuring. Is it a joke? Why Michael and his monkey rendered in gold? It was just absolutely perplexing in a certain respect. So it was beguiling, it's seductive. There was something very attractive, but also unknowable. Unknowable sounds rather good, actually. Yeah, I mean, even to this day, you always want to see what has he done now, whether you like it or not. A decapitated woman with her massive breasts in the tub, beautifully colored. Problematic for some of us feminists, very problematic. Um, cheeky, so cheeky. And that's sort of his point. How far can he go? And then it's corny, and then it is pop, and it is surreal. I mean, there's a whole host of decapitated women in the surrealist canon. It makes me nuts. This is another a surrealist a, a strategy. Make sure their breasts are evident, but cut off their heads. And the Pink Panther embracing this beautiful naked blonde. The culling from comic book culture, culling from Disney, highly sexualized and absurd. There's a fabulous piece, Naked. It shows two little kids. They almost seem weirdly twinned. They gaze into a flower. And it seems to be a scene of innocence. But what do they see in that flower? There's always a moment in which that, that innocence darkens somehow. Or it's, it's shot through with its, its opposite. And that's actually what makes him, I think, of real interest. You know, for every song of innocence, there's a song of experience cut right into his work. That goes against his rhetoric but it's there in the work. So the work is actually better than the rhetoric, I think. When he's dealing with the kind of banal bourgeois taste, that's exactly the taste of the world that he grew up in. That's the world he came from. It doesn't make sense to think of Jeff as just making a critique about kitsch. He is in a sense, but he's, there's also a love of it. The two things need to be married in order to turn it into something that's significant in art. Bear and policeman, when you first see it, you think it's just a big curio, a big souvenir, you know, souvenir blown up. But he makes it so weird. The bobby is made boyish. The bear is made paternal. There's a sexual exchange there. And there's also an allegory, I think, about, you know, big Papa Bear American culture and not so big English popular culture. It's not literal, it's not direct, it's weird and, and subtle. And that's where, where Koons is good. Some of the pieces, though made more sexual and sinister, are so close to their originals that they have, perhaps not surprisingly, prompted copyright cases. Coons had to pay off the photographer of puppies. Other cases are still ongoing to this day. The American artist doesn't feel as though they need permission. Uh, they're like this young little kid that'll just grab and do anything at once because it's really a kind of seeking uh, spiritual salvation. It doesn't feel like it has to perform in a good manner. And that's the strength, that's the heroicness of American art in the 20th century. Isn't that just about monstrous confidence? Monstrous confidence is one way to put it. Jeff Koons' next move was to put himself center stage. He spared no one's blushes. Made in Heaven is as provocative now as it ever was. His co-star was the Italian porn star and politician Ilona Stalla, known as Cicciolina.
I just had a tremendous success with the banality show. And I felt a little bit like what it's like to be an art star. And I felt that you really don't participate in American culture unless you're involved in film or, or music. So I thought, oh, well, make it like I'm going to be in a movie, I'll call it Made in Heaven, and I'll be starring Jeff Koons and Chicholina. And I thought, you know, I'll just, I'll hire her. I used her same photographer, sets, costumes. So her situation was really a ready-made, and I just put myself inside there. Literally. The project caused a storm, and while they were making it, Coons married Chicholina. My newest body of work, uh, Made in Heaven, tries to communicate to people that it's enough to be clever in life. And if you embrace your uh, history, you embrace your past, you have a foundation and you can be uh, effective in the world. If myself and my wife, uh, Ilona Stoller, Chicholina, if we've reached the bourgeois class, anybody can. So I'll never forget, Coons came to give a very big talk and he showed all of the made in heaven images, one after another after another, and you could have heard a pin drop in the room. He would say, now notice as I penetrate her from behind, the small pimple on her right cheek. And we were all like, oh my God. He just went on like that, like a scientist describing these unbelievably erotic images. They're staged and they're not especially erotic to me. These poses are the stock images that one would find in men's magazines. When you meet Jeff, he, he's, not, he's quite a private person. He's not an exhibitionist in any sense. And yet in his work, there is a sort of exhibitionism about it. The more you look at the work, the more it starts to unravel. You see the facade of sexuality, of a certain pose. It's like one of those Hollywood sets. What's beyond it? What's beyond that? Today, we are asked to be packaged, to be presentations. It's not just that we desire commodities, we are commodities too. And he wants us to, to be more at ease with that status. And you get the sense that, that he was all along. He encourages us to accept it, but we can't accept it. If that's what it is to be human, um, then, oh my God, you know? And that's where I see the, the dark side of Coons. He paints himself with this pornography specialist whom he married. What do you make of that? It's not my favorite work of art. <laughs> Some of them are quite straightforwardly pornographic. But he's married to the person <laughs> he's having sex with. So are these intimate marriage pictures? Are they pornographic? Family pictures. Family pictures. These are, these are self-portraits. Ilona, what type of life do we lead? I understand the amor. What type of life do we lead? We lead a life of the Rococo. Ah, we live a life Rococo. Rococo. In heaven, everything is fine. When the BBC made this film with Coons, he and Chicholina had just had a son, Ludwig. For a he was flying high. And this is our ticket to enlightenment. Elevators have a very spiritual function in this building. They offer a moment of contemplation and they can shoot you up to heaven a hundred floors in 50 purgatorial seconds. But it was pride before a fall, and what a fall. Just after making the film, Chicholina left him and took Ludwig with her. Jeff embarked on a two decades long struggle to produce these vast 10 ton toys. He called them celebrations.
I think all art involves out of some autobiographical aspect. It was a period where I was kind of losing trust in humanity. And I felt that kind of everything that was right was kind of made wrong. And so, uh, but I held on through uh, my work. And uh, so uh, this is kind of a, a reflection uh, of that. Uh, but I, in a way, I guess I don't want to go too much there. Jeff's ambition for celebration was beyond our capacity to realize it. At one point, I had commitments of $11 million into celebration, and not a single work realized. Several foundries went bankrupt trying to achieve what Jeff demanded. The financial demands on me Jeff's demands on the work, and then in the middle of this, the custody battle, his son with Chicholina, the whole thing imploded. People would forget that there's a period in Jeff's career in the 90s, I think he had one show in New York in the, in the whole of the 90s. It seems amazing, but there. So, the, so there's a, he, he's not the most fashionable person. He comes back in this very big way with these extraordinary, very large-scale things, and he kind of reinvents himself. I remember hearing he put 35,000 man-hours of polishing into a cracked egg, and then decided he didn't like it and scrapped it. You know, I'd, I'd kind of probably try and paint it with a roller and sell it for a uh, as it was as, a, as an early work, you know, before I went on to then make the other ones. It's completely phenomenal like that. The gamble, the persistence, paid off. Celebrations are now probably Kuhn's most popular works. They sell for multi-millions. Damien Hurst is a big collector. Many take pride of place in his office, with the elephant on his desk. The oldest bronze sculpture is 6,000 years old. So when Jeff's making these things that look like you could pop them with a pin, but they're actually going to last potentially, you know, thousands and thousands of years. Ethereality, but solidity at the same time. I mean, I just bought that piece of Play-Doh, which is phenomenal. You know, that's about possibilities and the future. It's like, you know, Play-Doh, you know, is, is the first sort of material you try to mould into something that comes out of your own mind. I mean, this started 20 years ago. In, indeed. I mean, this piece was originally conceived in 1994 and it was really just finished days before we brought it here uh, to the museum in June. Why? So, um, well, it's a good story. When Jeff began working on it, he imagined that he would make it out of polyethylene, which is the plastic you see here in Cat on a Clothesline and he was unable to get the level of detail that he wanted. And eventually Jeff had to change the material from plastic to cast aluminum, which is what you see here. Jeff always talked about wanting to make reflective works that capture the viewer, you, me, the world. He was imagining the joy that a child might have or the sense of wonder in a balloon dog or an amount of Play-Doh. And then how could you give an adult viewer like us that feeling? so that we might today not be that excited by a little balloon animal, but then this uh, makes people's eyes widen. A great reaction to any art is wow, and Jeff's work is full of that. It makes me think about America, and all the shit about America and all the great things about America at the same time. America's very jaded, but Jeff's not. A lot of people think artists have to give answers, but they don't, they raise questions. And they raise questions that enable you to find answers as a viewer. But the responsibility is on the viewer, really, not on the artist. 
And I think Jeff does that time and time again, you know, relentlessly. You know, making you feel like a child, making you feel hopeful. I suppose as an artist I should be competitive with Jeff, but when you walk into a Jeff Koons exhibition you forget about all that and you just go, you just inhabit it like a child and just go, this is unbelievable. From York to New York, Jeff Koons conquered the world, even if he didn't take all the critics with him. And the wonder, the undertow and the menace come from the world of his childhood. I would go out swimming in the ocean with my dad and sometimes I'd wear a type of styrofoam that helped keep me afloat. And so I think that there's something about my you know, sharing some moment with my father. What I like about these pool toys is they're anthropomorphic of what it means to be a human. They're, they're like us, you know, they're filled with air and we're inflatables. Uh, we inhale and it's a symbol of life and, you know, our last breath is a symbol of death. This is Coons with his father, who died in 1994, at the lowest point in Jeff's career. Twenty years on, Jeff Coons has become the most commercially successful artist alive. Jeff was never interested in making money. He was interested in having money to fabricate his works. It was about creating this notion of what was in his mind. Now they're kind of like overblown, hyper-consumer toys, baubles for the rich and famous. What I see that he's now done hundreds of these shiny things. They're getting bigger. I just think, enough. Stop filling up the space. Try to hark back to the day where you just breathed into a little toy of vinyl. Try to do something intimate. We know we're being reflected. We know what they represent. You've done it for 20 years, so do something else, maybe. Some people do say he's just repeating himself, and it's all just about money. It's unbelievably expensive to produce. He has his limited group of collectors who enable him to carry on, and you know, one can say about them. But I mean, that's always been the case. You know, I mean, Rubens had his kings, and Benini had his cardinals. He's supported by the cardinals and kings of his time. Thank God for that, because if it weren't for those people, we wouldn't be able to have him in quite the same way. Puppy. Jeff Koons' collusion with nature. These are live plants, and that brings in biology, the animate and the inanimate. Art always wants to become life's energy, and it always fails, but it always tries to do that. These plants also put you in contact with your own mortality. There's a funerary aspect to it also. I think it's one of the great works of our time. The scale of the object, the image of the puppy, and then to make it out of flowers. You could describe it as having a painterly surface. It's textured, it's full of different colors, and it changes in the time of day, in the season. It is really very, very extraordinary, extraordinary thing. And very, very magical. The reputation may be fought over, but the works keep coming and growing.
After five months at the Pompidou in Paris, the retrospective continues at the Guggenheim in Bilbao. And so that's kind of the sound of the hawk. <laughs> 